Well, I got a question for you. What? Are you ready to go cow tipping? No. We, got, we are going to attempt one of the most ridiculous series I've ever done in my life. And we are going to jump into God's word. And I believe this series is going to bless you and bless this church. Amen? Because I know the church as a whole has many sacred cows. You may say, what in the world are you talking about? Basically, what a sacred cow is, they're things that we don't like to talk about. Or there's things that we say, well, we're not allowed to talk about those things in our church. And my stance as your pastor, and I want you to know this, my stance, as long as God has called me here as your pastor, we will talk about anything God speaks about in his word with love and with grace. But watch this. We will not sacrifice truth. I want you to know that. We will not sacrifice it. I heard it once said um, that churches are like mushroom farms. They're kept in the dark and fed manure. Heard that one time. I know, isn't that disgusting? I don't want our church to be that kind of church. I want our church to be the kind of church that will confront anything with the light of God's word. And you could say amen to that because I thought that was pretty good. All right. Thank you. Got one, one clap. Thank you. All right. Got one person leaving. All right. Well, look at that. I didn't even get into the good stuff yet, man. Already walking out. All right. Lord bless him. All right. He's got to come back. All right. <laughs> so, we will have the opportunity over the next several weeks. Now, this series is planned to go four weeks. It may go longer. Um, we'll see what the Lord wants to do. I kind of have this series laid out in the next four weeks. Um, but I want to prepare um, you that, that join this series. And I shared this on Facebook Live. I have some cow jo- jokes prepared. Um, and, 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 and listen to me. They may not be very funny. I'm going to include them throughout the service. But... They are meant to, to uh, produce some, um, some comedy and maybe the sense of a tense subject or maybe even a tense thing we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Maybe, okay, you don't get it, all right. And here's what I'm saying, all right? I'll, I'll kind of show you what I'm saying. Today, here's our topics. Are you ready? Yeah. We're going cow tipping. Here's our topics. Here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about divorce, abortion, sexual orientation, Shacking up, friends with benefits, and in short, sexual sin. Saying all of that, let's move right along. You called on. All right. <laughs> you caught right along. All right. So here's what I want to do this morning. We're going to open up God's Word. We're going to read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 5. This intense chapter, intense subject, but we're going to dive in this morning. Is that cool? So to do this, would you stand, and I don't don't do this a lot, but would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? Come on. God's word is holy, and this seems out of place. You're like, oh, i got to stand. I stand the whole time, and I ain't necessarily the best in shape. So if I can do it, you can do it, all right? And we're going to dive in this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read the whole stinking chapter. Is that cool? All right, here's, here's 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 where we go. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Of a kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. And watch this. This is Paul writing to the the church at Corinth. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Someone say, oh. Oh. And you're proud of it. So Paul's kind of getting in their business. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in what? In spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on him who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that, someone say so that, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of judgment. Thought about putting this into practice after, after service we'll have a, have a handing over to Satan thing. For, I'm just kidding. Oh, that was, all right, uh, we'll see. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, someone say old, so that you may be new, unleavened batch, as you really are. Someone say, as I really am. As I really am. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep with the festival, not with old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and what? What's that word? Truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual and more people. Watch watch what Paul says now. 
Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you. Someone say it's for me. That you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but a sexual immoral or greedy or an idolater or a standard or sorry, slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with that's just some harsh stuff, man. Do not even eat with such a person. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside the church? God will judge those outside. And look what, look how he ends this. Expel the wicked person from among you. Come on, let's pray. God, I pray right now. Over these next couple moments we have together. God, I pray this. I pray you would stand in my body and speak through my mouth. God, I pray this would not be Jared's words or people would not hear, just hear my voice. God, they would hear what you have to say. God, we live in days where compromise is so simple and so easy. God, and when we give a little foothold, sometimes we allow our life to go to a place we never thought it would go. So I pray this morning, oh God, may your word speak clearly and let people understand things in all of our lives, mine included, that needs to be changed. God, we love you. And all God's people say... Amen. Amen. Come on, we turn to someone before you see it and say, are you ready to go cow tipping? You can grab a seat. Oh. So, I was driving one time, and I think this was on, I was trying to reflect on this. I think this was on one time I was heading on vacation, um, but I'm not sure the exact scenario, but I'll tell you what was kind of going on. So, I was driving one time. And we're making good time where we were going. I think it was about three hours away. Um, I don't think this was last year. I think this was about two or three years ago. And we were driving, making good time. We kind of avoided the heavy traffic that was coming. And I was like, man, we're, we're, we're doing really good. I missed all the traffic. When all of a sudden, we merged into an, uh, um, a new highway. And, and the minute we merged on, it was just like, boom, everything came to a dead stop. It was bumper to bumper traffic. We didn't even get over like maybe five miles an hour. And for an hour and a half, we're stuck in this. And I thought, man, I thought we missed all this stuff. And now we're stuck in this traffic and we're going to get there late. And I'm just complaining, you know what I'm saying? And finally, an hour and a half later, we get to the scene of what had caused all of this backup. You know what happened? It was a, it was a little, kind of crazy, little, little, little fender bender. Like not even like a big accident, just a little fender bender. And what was causing the, you know what was causing the backup? Everyone was stopped looking at the fender bender and they would slowly drive by it and then go. You know what they call that? Rubbernecking. I'm like, man, we got a bunch of rubberneckers. Like, they're, they're perceiving and they're seeing this scene that's not even that bad right now, but it caused me to sit in traffic for an hour and a half. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was kind of mad. And here's why I say that. I think, and this pertains to me too, the church sometimes can be filled with rubberneckers. And here's what I mean by that. Rubbernecking is surveying the scene of something ugly with no intention to do anything to help anybody. Think about that. The church, that's, that can be us sometimes. I think in pulpits all across America, for too long the body of Christ has been stopped in our progress of where God wants to take us. Because we're surveying the scenes of something ugly. But we have no intention to help someone, to pull someone out of the, the thing they're in. And I, I say that because I want that to be your thought today as we dive into this passage. Because this is a very interesting passage, is it not? Did you know this stuff's in the Bible? Isn't it crazy? When you read the Bible, you read some wild stuff. You're like, whoa, this is in the Bible. And I think there's a larger point that Paul, who was the author of the book of Corinthians, he was writing to the Corinthian church, I think there was a larger point that he's trying to make than just trying to, trying to just say, hey, there's sexual sin going on in this church. You have a situation here at the church of Corinth. Someone say Corinth. Come on, someone say Corinth. There's a Christian who has gone absolutely wild. Someone say wild. And in fact, we don't really have any evidence based on the Bible that he's even a Christian by the way he's living his life. But Paul says, based on, on the actions this individual was showing, I'm passing judgment on this man. And, he's, and, he, and this man is going around having, having relations with, with, with this woman who supposedly many scholars believe was his stepmom. And he's, and he's doing it by naming the name of Christ while he's doing it. Are you following me? So, Paul 
in, in, in his context, he's passing judgment, but he's also, watch this, I want you to catch this. He's also surprised that it's happening in the church. Like, he's not at all surprised about what, well, what was happening around the church. It was shocking that it was happening, someone say, in the church. Now, like I said, it didn't surprise Paul that there was sexual immorality around the church at Corinth. There's nothing shocking about that. I want you to know that. People sometimes get out of whack. Because Paul said, I mean, I'm not shocked. I'm not, I'm not bewildered. I'm not disgusted that, that it's out there. I'm bewildered and concerned because it's in where? Here. here. It's in here. See, the church, and I got a lot of notes. That's why I'm looking down a lot because I really, like I said, this has been months of prepping, and I wrote a lot of stuff down. I had over 60 pages of notes. So I added 61, so we'll be here for two hours. Just kidding. Lunch provided. <laughs> no lunch provided. See, in the church, I want you to stick with me. See, in the church, we act surprised sometimes when we see sexual immorality that is around us. And we shouldn't be. You know why? That's how a, a, a world should act that is not following Jesus. I want you to think about this for a moment. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be bewildered when, when laws and, and things are trying to get passed in our nation. Now, now it's concerning. It breaks my heart when, 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 we, when we see that now can, anything can go on TV and now nudity can just flash wherever it wants to flash and, and there's, not, there's no really filters anymore. But I'll tell you what, that's how, that's how a world without Jesus should act. Would you agree? When you take people who are not born again by the Spirit of God and who have no standards for reigning in their own pleasures, restricting their own indulgence, watch this, why should we expect anything else? I want you to think about that for a moment. Why should we expect anything else from our world? I think what we have done in the church, I say we, because I'm saying this, someone say collectively, I'm including myself, we have, got, we have gotten really good at doing the exact opposite of what Paul was talking about in this passage. He says, he says we are to judge, someone say ourselves, we are to judge ourselves within the church and extend grace to those outside the church. Are you with me? You follow me so far? All right, we're going somewhere with this. Because we, as a church, and I say it collectively as a church as a whole, we typically get it backwards. We're really good at judging those outside the church. Or I'll put it this way, and I'm going to read this verbatim because I want to get it the way I wrote it. We are really good at cultural condemnation, but not as good as, per not, not as, good at, as personal repentance. Think about this. We're good at judging the world around us, but we're not good at looking into our own life and seeing things that need to change. Lord, help us. And that's maybe a good part to say. That's good preaching right there. I'll say it to myself. Preach it, baldy. You know, so I'll say it to myself. So basically, Paul's point is this. There should be a different standard. Someone say different standard. For the people of God. There should be a, a standard for those, and watch this, there should be a standard for those who use the name of Jesus. Do you understand that? There should be a different standard of those whose claim to be forgiven by the grace of God. Are you following me? Sometimes I hear of reports of things that go on, not just in this church, but in churches all across America. And it makes me wonder, do they really understand the purpose of grace? Here's what grace is. We typically think grace is a, is a commodity to cover our sin. But I want to tell you this morning, grace is the power to remove your sin and to help you to live like Jesus. That's what grace is. It's not a commodity to live how you want, yet name the name of Jesus. It's the power to remove your sin. So I want to address my first big thing this morning. Are you ready? My first big thing. I hear sometimes... In churches, I'm saying churches collectively because I travel here or there and minister at churches and hear pastors say things to me and it breaks my heart. But I'm talking to our church and, and other churches I've been to. Sometimes I hear of people who come to church and, 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 and they're, they're living together and they say, well, well, well we're not married, but, but you know, they, they think God understands. They think God is cool in their specific situation. I want you to hear this. I actually heard someone say this one time years ago. It was, a, it was a, a grown man. He said this to me. 
I'm just being open today. My life is, a, is an open book to you guys. I want you to know that. I'm saying this out of love and grace and truth. I heard, I heard a guy one time say this to me. He said, you know, you got to test out the merchandise before you buy it. That's what he told me. He said, I look at living together before married kind of like a test drive. I mean, I sat there for a moment, like just shocked that he just said that to me. I'm like, oh, wow. But this is when you know what I told him back. Because I say this in grace and truth, but I, this is what I said. I said, it's not a test drive. It's carjacking. That's what it is. You know why? Because it's not your vehicle. I'm just being open. Did you know you're bought with a price? My body is not my own. Did you know that? My body is not my own. When I married my wife, I, she understood that when I come together with her, my body is not mine, it's God's. And me joining in, in holy matrimony with her is now me giving myself of what I kept with God now to her. It was an awesome thing. It was a glorious thing. And I went to say, and I said this to this, this guy, I said, and that young lady you're test driving, she's not yours. And that's what I said. You ready for the last part? I walked away after this because I don't want to keep embracing this conversation. I said, if I was her dad, I'd kick your butt. And I walked away. How do you like that for a pastor? Should we say that? Sorry, sometimes I just get overwhelmed by things that we face in our world, especially in our church. And again, we shouldn't be shocked at some things in our world. But when it comes to our church, I want us to fully know what God's stance is on things. Because here's why. I want God's best for every single one of you. Is that okay? I want God's best for you. I really do. As a pastor, I will stand before God, not just for Jared, but I want you to hear this. Every single person that's ever came to a service or been in an event that I've ever shared or talked about, I want you to know this. God will align my words with his and say, did you give them truth? Yes, did you extend salvation and grace and love, but did you give them my word or your word? Are you with me? So here's the thought. Remember, Paul was contrasting a sharp difference between judging those outside the church and those what? Inside the church. He said there ought to be a higher standard for who? Those inside the church. So, so it's interesting. So when you hear of politicians running off and, 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 and cheating on their wife, right? You, you ever heard this before in the news? You, you, man, you, you read the news sometimes, and you hear of politicians. Sometimes it kind of makes you angry, right? You hear all this news sometimes of, of people who are in government officials driving in their million-dollar planes, heading off to, 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 a, to a hotel to meet and, and have a one-night stand with this lady. And we feel kind of angry because we feel like, man, these people should be held to a higher standard. But Paul said this, those who name the name of Jesus Christ ought to be held to a higher standard. And he's so passionate about what he's saying. I don't know if you read this the way I read it. He calls out this member of the church of Corinth who's involved in this incest relationship with his stepmom. That's what most scholars believe. That this, this guy was involved with relations with his stepmom. And Paul says this has gotten so bad at this church. I'm talking about the church of Corinth. It's gotten so bad that even the world looks at that church and they scratch their head. And they, 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 look at, they look at their lives and, and they say, and I want you to think about this for a moment. Do people look at our lives and say this? They look at their lives and they say, if this is the Jesus you preach about, and he cannot enable you to live the life you claim to believe and his standards, then why should I put my faith and trust in him for my eternity? So let me take a, well, let me take a look at your life and my life today. Because... We love to talk about church discipline and look at other people in bad situations. And I want you to understand, I've been involved in church discipline. I'm only 20 years old. I've been in some nasty church disciplines. It breaks my heart. Pastors who had moral failures sitting in, um, sitting on their board of advisors and having to deal with that. It is not fun. Breaks my heart. And again, I'm only, I'm only a 28-year-old dude, and sometimes I'm like, whoa. But... There should be a higher standard for those of us who name the name of Christ. Are you with me? And as a church, we should always be looking at our own heart and not so fast to look at other people's. Are you with me? Now, the first thing isn't like, well, we look at people's hearts and not serving God. We kick them out of the church because they're corrupting us. Now, there's certain cases where, where you do have to conf confront sin. Paul's very clear about that, especially people who are naming the name of Christ. 
But I'm not talking about like someone who's, who had a little, oh, sorry, bro, you had a little bit too much to drink on the Christmas party. You know, we need to talk about you coming to our, I'm not talking about that. I want you to hear me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, and I want to pause here for a second and just say this. If we kicked all the imperfect people out of the church, you wouldn't even have a pastor. Are you with me? I want you to know that. I'm not, I don't claim to be perfect. I want you to know that, that you to know that this passage is not so much of just passing judgment on this individual. Because this church is a recovery room for the sick. I said that earlier. That's why we're here. We're like a hospital for sick people to come in. But, but, but this, this example Paul's giving is of someone who wrongfully wronged his father and is now corrupting the church because of his actions. Are you following me? And here's what I'll say about that. When you're living in blatant sin and you're unwilling to repent and you're professing, then this is where Paul really names it. When you're professing the name of Jesus, like I'm a follower of Jesus, then are you really doing more good or more harm? And I'm talking to all of us here. With our slandering tongues and gossip lips, with, with sometimes our, our, our ways that, that aren't lined up with God's word and we refuse to turn to Jesus, we can tend to set a bad example for those who maybe want to follow Jesus, but they look at our life. When I hear pastors who had moral failures, like I was telling you about, I've been on a couple times and it breaks my heart of dealing with that. They cheated on their wife. And we think this in our heart when we hear about those stories. How dare they, right? How dare they? She aren't, isn't a pastor supposed to be held to a higher standard? How dare they do that to their wife? How dare they sleep with another woman who's not their wife? It makes you angry, right? When a, government fly, when a governor flies off and hooks up with someone else that's not his wife. But I want to ask you this, and this is what God spoke to me as I was praying through this part of my message. This is what God asked me, and I'm going to ask it to you. Does your own hypocrisy generate the same anger inside of you because you want to accurately represent the God who sent his son to die for you. That hit me like a bed of nails. You know what I did when I, when, when, when I really felt that in my heart? I lay down on the floor, and I just said, God, I need you. Because so many times we hear of all these things going on. We're so quick to slam others. How dare they? But I want you to think about this. Does our own, our own heart, accurately portray the God that we serve. Maybe this passage isn't so much about kicking hypocrites out of the church as it is kicking the, the hypocrisy out of ourselves. Think about that. I want you to know that. This is, I'm just sharing my heart with you. Paul passed judgment on this individual. Well, maybe you ask today, well, doesn't the Bible say don't judge? You know, we all know the, 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 the famous passage, Matthew 7, where Jesus says don't judge or it will be judged unto you, right? But I want to ask you this. There's a difference in the Bible between judging the heart and judging sin. Did you know that? The Bible is very clear on that. Read it. It's all in the book of, you can read it in Corinthians, go deeper in this passage. You can go on to the next passage. The Bible is very clear on that, about judging heart versus sin in church. Because I want to think about it. If we really can't judge, then, then in a way we can't judge murderers. We can't judge rapists. We can't. Don't judge. Don't judge, right? It's not so much about judging heart. It's about judging the action and the sin. Are you with me? You follow me? All right, y'all looking at me like a, like a deer in headlights. But I want you to think this. It's not our part to pass eternal judgment. Did you know that? God's the ultimate judge. I do not judge your heart. I simply open God's word, present it as he, as he says, Pastor Jared, I want you to present it this way. And I want you to know, I really take this stuff serious. I don't take this lightly. Just let me stand up here and preach some of this. Because I want your life to align with God's word. And again, it's, it's not us judging hearts. But we certainly must understand sin. And we must understand that, man, we need to have a different standard. And we, it doesn't start with Disney World or all of these other places. To set the, it starts with the church of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? It doesn't start with groups of people and we marginalize them and we say, well, these are the bad people. And then they never want to hear about the gospel of Jesus because we put them in a group and, and said, well, these are the bad people. We must start by judging first ourselves. We must judge our motives. Someone say our motives. We must say, God, is there anything in my life that's separating me from your best? Someone say God's best. And if I could just walk down every aisle in this church and every teenager that attends this church, 
And if I could unzip, and we lead a, a Sunday night life group for teens, and if I could unzip all the junk this world tries to put in them at such a young age and take out all that filth and just fill you with the Spirit of God, I tell you what, I wish I could do that. Because this world wants to trap you. And so what I want you to do, I want you and myself, I want us to judge ourselves today. Now ultimately, here's the awesome part about why we serve a God. Ultimately, God what? He forgives us. And he cleanses us by the blood of Jesus, right? Amen? All right. Come on, you guys. I'll wake up. But that forgiveness is not a license to say, hey, you're forgiven. Go do what you want. I got your back. I'll cover you. Like that? Cover you? Get it? Okay. Y'all are asleep. It's not a license to live how we want. It's not a license to let someone who isn't married to you, put their hands on your body. I want you, I want you to hear my heart on this. Maybe someone's listening to this sermon or they'll go home tonight and, and, or, or, and this week they'll rewatch the sermon or they'll watch it for the first time and they're watching it on their device and the same device that's, that's preaching the word of God at other hours of the night. They're watching images and, and nudity and profanity all on that same device. I want us to look at ourselves today, all of us. See, Paul passed judgment on this man. And probably if, 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 if someone's caught in a typical sexual sin, some, a lot of times this is what, what I'll hear. Yeah, but you don't know me, Pastor Jared. You don't know my situation. To which I would say this. I don't have to. We don't judge people based on particular situations. We judge based upon, here's my word, sorry about that. We judge on principles. Are you with me? We judge on principles. And the principles in God's word is what we call immutable. Someone say immutable. That's a big word. Basically meaning you can't argue with God's word. Now, people do, and they make exceptions, and they make things, well, I'm different. Well, sorry, Bubba. It's God's word. Sorry, sister, I love you. It's God's word. You with me? And we're not the exception. I'm not the exception to God's word. Are you with me? And I pray if ever anything I do or say would, would come against God's word, someone would have the guts to call me out. Are you with me? I ask that of you. Because as much as I preach, I should be held in living to the same standard at which you guys do. Are you with me? There's no exception. There's no exception. So, in saying that, you, you still wake? I want to take uh, just a few minutes. I want to make this very practical, very practical. I sent my notes to my dad, to other, um, other pastors I'm great friends with, because I wanted this to not be Jared's opinions. I wanted this to be God's word, okay? So I'm going to make this practical because I, pre I hate to preach this whole message and think, well, this is for Jimmy or Joey or, or Saudi. I don't, I'm just making up all these names. These are random names that come to me, right? This is for Bubba that sits in the back, right, and comes in a little tipsy, right? These are for all those people, not for me. I hate to go the whole service and not make this so practical that we can't test and observe our hearts. Are you with me? No. All right, so I want to take you just through some, some tough things. Because I figured there's no point in me to shrink back from talking about anything that's in God's word. There's questions continually asked at this church. And they'll ask me something like this. What's the church's stance on blank? So I want to go ahead and maybe answer some of them for us. Is that cool? Now again, I align them with God's word and I say it in grace and love. Is that cool? All right. So let's jump in because I'm going to milk this thing for all it's worth. All right. Thank you, Miss Lori. All right. <laughs> All right. Number one, what does the church believe about abortion? What does the church believe? We believe God forgives all people. And if you had an abortion, guess what? Jesus is not done with your life. He is not done with you. God forgives you, and he loves you. But abortion ultimately in God's word is wrong. And ultimately, the Bible talks of it as a sin. You can look it up, and I can give you passages. But again, I'm not trying to quote God. Sorry, not trying to quote Jared's word. I'm trying to give you God's word as it is. This isn't my opinion. And this is, this is what I wrote. I heard a pastor say this one time to me when I told him I was sharing this. He said this, for the right for, the, for, the right for unborn life is greater than a woman's right to choose. Always. Don't you believe in a woman's right to choose? Yeah, I do. I really do. 
But I also believe in the women that we're aborting and their right to choose as well. I really do. Now, again, I'm not saying this as my opinion. I'm saying this as God's word. I want you to know this. I, I, I have walked with women who have had multiple abortions. I've been by their side at night when they would be wanting to kill themselves because of the fear and anxiety and depression that has haunted them. It is not fun. And if I could take you to those places, which I never would want to because it is horrifying. But as your pastor, I want to give you all of God's word. Now, you may have had multiple abortions. You may know of someone. I want you to know this. I'm a sinner. And I, I can't even imagine how my own words and actions have hurt people. I want you to know that. I can't even imagine sometimes some things that come out of my mouth that might have landed in someone's ears and hurt them. I can't imagine how my actions have done that. I need the grace of God just like everyone else. Are you with me? But this is a cow that the church just kind of likes to avoid and takes a step back from and doesn't like to talk about. And I want to embrace these tough things because we live in a world where we need to embrace these things in love. Are you with me? So I want to say this because as I was preparing this, some of those young ladies that I've walked with, some of them didn't even break their 20s before they had multiple ones. Yeah, this is real stuff. I want to tell you this. If you're hearing you had multiple abortions, some of those young ladies are actually going to watch this sermon um, after it comes out. I told them, and they're excited to watch it because they've experienced God's healing grace and they're walking in freedom like I've never seen them walk. There's a smile on their face that I'll tell you what, I can never give them. Only the grace of God could. But I want, I want, I want to tell you this, because if you know someone who's maybe had one or multiple ones, or maybe you know someone who's maybe thinking about one, here's what I would say. God would have you trust in his sovereignty. And if you are here today, and you have made that mistake or maybe thinking about it, would you turn to Jesus and trust in his forgiveness you with me I want you to know that again I've seen the power of God at work I've walked hand in hand and I don't say this thing out of out of just blowing steam off my head I've been there I've seen it walked with women and, and Lord I've seen the freedom that comes that God can bring you he's not done with you maybe he's just getting started with you amen all right here's another one you ready you with me all right I told you we're gonna embrace some tough things what does the church believe about homosexuality? We, well, glad you asked. We believe marriage is between one man and one woman. Anything outside of sex before marriage is considered a sin. Now, I want you to get what I'm saying here. I'm talking about both someone who's sleeping with someone of the opposite sex just as much as I'm talking with someone who's sleeping with someone of the same sex. It's a sin. Here's, the, here's, the, here's God's drawing line. You sleep with your husband wife you sleep with your wife brother and that's the standard and I love how God's word can I tell you this brings freedom and joy can I tell you a story is that cool a little tense cut the air all right and here I say this in love I was preaching one night in my youth group a young lady walks in the back looked like a man but she walked in the back I actually called her sir, and she looked at me, and, and I'm, I said, sorry, sorry. She ended up becoming a regular tender at our youth group, would come every single Wednesday night, sit in the back. And I felt intimidated because I'm like, man, this is tough, man. I knew she was going through some stuff. Finally, months after she was coming, she came down, and she said, I want you to know I'm a lesbian. She said, that's who I am. I said, okay. She said, well, you're not going to slap me? I said, no. She said, you're not going to kick me out? I said, no. I said, did you, have you given your life to Jesus? No. Did you not hear what I just said? I said, well, all right. I said, you keep coming. She just kind of looked at me kind of funny. Just think of the there we go. She kind of looked at me kind of funny. She came for months. Finally, one Wednesday night, it was a cold Wednesday night, she came, and a woman came with her. It was her wife. She had been married. She was married to her. They came that night. They sat in the back. I preached, it wasn't even about anything like that. I preached God's word. I just said, I know there's some people here that need to respond to God's word. I said, you need to come forward and respond. And with saying that, we dimmed the lights. The worship team came up. 
And she and that woman came forward, tears flooding their eyes. And, and I grabbed her and I gave her this hug and I said, what is going on? And she said, I cannot explain it. But she said, I feel a love that I've never felt before and I've never gotten. She said, I've tried it all. But there's a love right now in this room. And I said, well, why don't you embrace the love and let God handle the next couple days? Embrace this love. So she embraced it. We prayed. Her and her wife accepted Jesus. Fast forward two years later. After that moment, they came. And then, and then they graduated. And I never saw them again. Two years later goes by. I'm dropping a friend off. He had just got a job at this trailer shop where they make trailers for boats. Okay? Follow with me. I'm dropping him off for work. It's early in the morning. I have him. His name was Tank. He was um, the street entrepreneur. He sold drugs in our, in our community. Chris, you remember him? I'm dropping him off for work. He got this side job working for trailers. And long story short, when I'm dropping him off, he's getting out of the car. I told him, have a blessed day. I'll see you at whatever time. I told him to pick him up. And I'm pulling out. And as I'm pulling out, I see this young lady beautiful young lady running towards my car. And I'm like, girl, you better watch out. You know what I'm saying? You're about to get hit by me. Um, but she is bolting it towards my car. And I'm like, what is this young lady doing? And so I pumped on the brakes and she like almost collided right into my window. And I'm like, can I help you? And, and she's like, you don't, you don't recognize me. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't. I said, you know, can you tell me? And she tells me her name and I, my eyes light up. And it's this young lady. I said, how you been? She said, well, pastor, I graduated high school and I went to college. And I said, oh, that's awesome. I'm so proud of you. And, and, and I said, that's so great. And she said, I want to tell you this too, pastor. She says, me and that young lady, we ended up getting a divorce. And she said this. She says, I'm married now. I have a kid. And then she showed me her stomach and she had one on the way. And I said, what happened? And she said, well, I left youth group, went to college. She said, while I was there, I found a Christian group, got involved, and the same things you were talking about in that church, they were talking about. So I got involved, started to get plugged into a church, met this man who attended the church. It was just wild. I've seen the power of God transform lives, and I will, not, never, I will never back down from seeing the best for God in people. Are you with me? I've seen it. So there's a standard. Again, I don't know your heart. The church, like to, we like to judge hearts, don't we? Well, you're this way because of this, or you act this way because of that. We like to, we like to judge people's hearts sometimes. But I want to tell you, I can't judge hearts, but we can certainly judge sin. Are you with me? But I want to tell you this. It's for sin that Jesus died. Did you know that? It's a, it's a sin that he can forgive. It's a sin he can help you overcome. Come on. And I'll, I'll end this final rant with this. It's a sin, but it's not too big that the grace of God cannot overcome it and forgive it. Are you with me? And he loves you and he died for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. I'll answer one more. Then we're going to move on. Many people like to ask, I get this one a lot. Pastor, what does the Bible say about divorce? You know, I want to tell you. God truly hates divorce. You can read it. It breaks his heart. You want, me to, you want me to tell you why? Look what it does to families. It's horrific. I had students that used to come to my youth group. The reason why a lot of times they acted the way they were when you did some digging. You see what it does to families. But I want to tell you this. If you had a divorce or going through one, I want to tell you this. It does not mean God's done with you or he put you on a shelf and said, sorry. No. He still has a plan. That's the whole point of why we're going cow tipping is because God is not done with you. He is just getting started, and the grace of God is, is more than enough to cover what you've been through. But it's important to understand, too, that the Bible's clear on things. And he has not put you as a second-rate Christian. And that does not have to define your life. My grandmother and grandfather got a divorce when my, parent, when my mom was really young. My grandfather liked to play with other women and, and, and not be dedicated to my grandmother. So my grandmother finally said, enough's enough. And, and she said, don't come back. And years went by, almost a decade went by. They never contacted. The kids grew up. And it affected my family in a very hard way. I've seen my uncles grieve 
over what had happened and, and take it out in, in rational ways. Christmas would come, and eventually when they were trying to start restoration with my grandfather, he would show up, and my one uncle was a pretty hefty dude, strong dude, and he said, if you cross the door, I'll kill you. I've seen it, I've seen it how it affects a family's life personally. But I've also seen it, how it transformed lives. Because on my grandfather's deathbed, guess who was the one taking care of him when he couldn't even get up off the chair to use the bathroom? My grandmother. I've seen God transform lives and restore it. I've seen it done. And again, God's not done with you. It breaks his heart, but he's not done because he loves you. And he has the best in store. It's like, for instance, when I was young, we were at my grandmother's house, and I picked up this dog that had run away from the neighbor's yard. I picked it up, and I said, Dad, you cannot let down a dog that loves you. And he looked at me, and the words hit him. The next week, we went, and we asked the owner, because the dog had had a whole bunch of puppies. My dad said, hey, could, could my son have that dog? And the guy finally said, yeah, why not? Because he had dozens of them running around. So I got, I got my first dog. We named him Shiloh after the movie Shiloh. It was like this awesome thing. He was a little like mixed everything. I don't even know what he was, but he was awesome. And, and I was little, so we kept him inside. And during the day, I'd go outside, and we'd run around the yard. Well, one day, I came home to my surprise after school. My dad was putting up this fence. I said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, you know, I'm putting a fence up. For Shiloh and for you. I said, Dad, we run around this yard. You're going to destroy my future with this dog. You're putting a fence up. You're limiting where I can go. And I, I, I cried. Literally, I did. I, I brought the dog out and said, Shiloh's crying. And my dad's like still nailing the pegs into the ground. Like, I don't care. And finally, after... A day my dad came in and into my room and, and the dog's there, I'm there, and I'm just in, you know, Dad, you cannot put this fence up, man. It's killing me. It, it's being shallow. We run the yard. And, and my dad said, buddy, I want you to understand this. I remember this. <laughs> buddy, I want you to understand this. This fence is not for you and Shiloh to never have fun again. This fence is because there's sometimes where mom can't always keep an eye on you and Shiloh. And you run around this yard and, and Shiloh's going to get big Shiloh. And big Shiloh is going to get curious, Shiloh. Curious Shiloh is going to want to run and be free, not always next to you, but maybe next to the next door cat. <laughs> and so this fence is to help you and Shiloh be free and to keep running harder and faster. And I finally understood it. When Shiloh got bigger, big Shiloh needed a leash. <laughs> you with me? <laughs> and I want you to understand this morning, the reason why I say that, God's parameters and his, his, his fences sometimes we feel in our life, they're not there as restrictions. They're not there to box you in and feel you tight and closed in. Man, these God's, God's level for my life, man, it's going to cramp my style. It's going to fence me in. It's going to ruin my life, maybe you say. But I want to tell you this. The fence brings freedom. It does. God puts those posts and those marks up, those commandments, those instructions in his, life, in, 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 in his word for our life to keep the bad stuff out of our life and to keep away anything that would squash us. The fence brings, someone say freedom. God wants you to enjoy his best. And this is another cow joke. He has green pastures for you. You like that? It's true. He does. Read about it. Psalms 23. There's a saying that I used to hear growing up. Man, he was looking at that thing like a cow at a new gate. You ever heard that? Maybe not because y'all city folk, right? I'm city folk too, but I heard that before. And sometimes some of us, we look at God's standards and instructions for our life like a cow looking at a new gate. We look at his commandments and we're just kind of staring at them like a cow would at a brand new gate. Man, I can't even imagine reorienting my life. You're saying it's wrong for me to look at pornography? Heard this one time. Man, I'm single. You're married. You can get it anytime you want. All the married men attest that's not true. Okay, only just me. All right. I'm not trying to be gross. I'm not. Listen, I'm not trying to be gross. I'm trying, I'm trying to be practical and helpful. Because we try to stand in our circumstance and say, well, you're not where I am. And I want you to know, just because being here doesn't make it all fun and games. I want you to know that. 
Heard that one time from a single guy. I did. I tell you, sometimes what comes in my mouth, it surprises me. <laughs> Again, I try to watch it. But I want you to think. Some of us look at God's parameters and standards like a cow looking at a new gate. Like I said, I'm not trying to be gross. You have, you have no idea. My wife could probably attest to this a little bit. The amount of stress I was under this week preparing for today. Amount of amount of anxiety that I never have anxiety. I never do. Man, good Lord. I couldn't even barely sleep some nights. Because I'm like, God, are you sure this is what you want? Like God, like even yesterday, we got home and I'm downstairs in, our, in, in the study. And I'm like, God, you could change this. We could preach something else. And literally, that's, I told him that. I said, I'm listening. I, I was down on the floor with worship music on with my head. I'm like, I'm going to get a new sermon tonight. I'm gonna ch- it's going to be all. And I'm like, no, God. Woke up this morning, walking the track with my dog. One more chance, God. But God said, no. You need to give people my word to its full. And I speak in a culture, and we live in a culture, like Paul was speaking to Corinth. And he was specifically calling out the sin. There are sins in our culture that people don't like to admit that are sins. I just want God's word to be our lens that we view things by at our church. Is that all right? All right. And here's what I want to say, and I'm bringing this plane and landing. When you're naming the name of Christ, but you're pushing every boundary you can, I want to tell you, you need to judge yourself so God won't have to. When you're flirting with a woman who is not your wife, when you're away from her, I want to tell you, sir, you're wrong. I want to tell you, I'm just trying to be practical. Ephesians 5.3, I got this one, CJ, you got me? You're the man, thank you, buddy. But among you, there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. Because there are, these are improper for what? God's holy people. Did you know that's who you are? That's how God sees you. As what? As his holy people. Isn't that an awesome term? Holy means what we were talking about in the four cups sermon of the champion sermon. Holy means set apart. You're not like this world, sister. Sir, you're not like this world. You're holy. You're set apart. So I want to tell you this morning, act like it. Act like it in your sexuality. Act like it in your business deals. It it goes for every area of your life. You're God's holy people. Paul says this. He says, like, you're like a new batch of dough. I love that thought because I like dough. I love bread. That's what he said. He said, get it. Can you tell? Maybe not. Okay. I love Texas Roadhouse. You know what I'm saying? We went there. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Okay, I'm done. All right. He He said, get out the old and in with the new. So I'm going to tell you this morning, act like who you already are in Christ. Act like you already are in Christ. Thank you, Allie. This culture will teach you if you're going to do sex God's way, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to cramp your style. If you're going to do it the way God wants to, it's going to suppress the true you. And I got this for someone here this morning. Are you ready? God's standard for sexuality isn't going to suppress the true you. It's going to express the new you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Baldy. Oh, you're welcome. God's not trying to suppress the, 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 the true you. He's trying to get you to express the new you. I, like I told you the stories earlier, the new you is so awesome and so exciting and so full of joy and passion and love. And that's my heart. That's why I spend hours here at the church late at night sometimes in my office weeping and crying for you. Because I want the new you to be the expression of you. Not this, what the culture is trying to say, well, bring out the, the real you. No, I bring out the new me. If you stay faithful and stay committed to Jesus, I want to tell you this. You really have done something with your life. I want to say something to all the singles. Maybe you've made a mistake in the past, but from this moment forward, you're going to do it God's way. Put fences in your life and allow God's grace to cover you. Do what you need to do. Get counseling. Get help. Confess it to a friend. Disconnect your internet. I'm telling you, do what you got to do. I saw one guy one time throw his TV out the front lawn. True story. Do what you got to do. When you keep yourself pure, you're expressing the true you. And the true nature of Christ. Amen. And I got this. I got two scriptures and I'm done. 
The primary effect of sexual sin isn't sexually transmitted diseases. It isn't the emotional scars. Those are very real. I want you to know those are very real. I understand that. But when you live outside of God's parameters for your life, here's what I want to tell you. We preach a false gospel. We say we know him, but we live as if he does not exist. I'll read two final challenging scriptures. 1 John 2, 4. Whoever says I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. 1 John 3, 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. This doesn't mean people who have a relationship with Christ don't slip up or struggle. I'm not saying that. This doesn't mean that temptation is a sign. You're doomed. You're going to burn in hell. I'm not saying that. But if you're naming the name of Christ and continually reject his standards for the sake of your own pleasure, I want to ask you this morning, Judge yourself, and ultimately, this is my prayer. I prayed this this morning so hard and fierce. Ultimately, repent. Amen? Amen. And I, I want to say this, and I got one final story. I'm a preacher, so I'm going to say I'm going to close 10,000 times, but it is 1230, and Kelly's going to kill me if I take much longer. So here we go. When the church gets better at holding our own marriages together, then maybe a watching world will be ready to listen about what we have to say about the laws that get passed in this country. That's my heart. That's where it's at. When you start walking according to God's standards and the way God established things, and maybe then we will have credibility in this world as Christians, and people will want to listen to what we have to say. There's a story told I don't know. I, I tried to research as much as I could. Everything I found said the story was true. But you do your own research and tell me if this wasn't. There's a story told of Alexander the Great, who had conquered most of the known world at the time, was riding into battle. And, and while he was riding on his horse, he came across a, a, a commander who was intensely yelling at a foot soldier, like just screaming so loud at him. So Alexander, curious about why this commander would be yelling at a foot soldier, pulled his horse over to look at the commander, and, and he asked the commander, Commander! And the commander saw Alexander Great. Yes, sir! Alexander said, Great, what is, what is the, the reason you're yelling? We're heading into battle. The commander said, This man's a coward! And Alexander said, Is that so? The commander said, Yes, sir. So Alexander stepped off his horse and approached the young, the young foot soldier. He said, Sir, what's your name? The foot soldier kind of intimidated now that Alexander the Great is in front of him. Kind of quiet, reserved. Alexander asked again a second time, Sir, what is your name? And the young man, intimidated with a soft voice, said, Alexander, sir. And Alexander said, he said, you have two options. Either you change your name or you get on that horse and you go into battle. He said, because you will not have the same name as me. And be known as a coward. And with that, he got on his horse and rode off. I say that to say this as I close. Us as Christians who are naming the name of Christ, we are to be held to a standard. And if we're going to name his name and carry it to this world and this city, we better hold ourselves to God's standards. I know this is intense. This is only week one. But I'll tell you this. As a pastor, I live in God's word with the Bible says fear and trembling. Because when I stand before God, like I say, and when you stand before God, he's going to ask, what did you do with the life I've given you? Did you compromise it with the word, with the world, or did you live it according to my standards? And my prayer is this. You will stand before God and say, God, I had my flaws and my mistakes, but I want to tell you this. Your word came alive in me one day, and it, 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 it announced the new me, and I stand before you now, not my old self, but a new person created in Christ Jesus to do the good works to which you had prepared for me. That's my prayer. Now, if one of these topics hits you this morning and you say, Pastor, one of these things you talked about, this was tough stuff, man, and God's dealing with me. Here's what I did. I told my wife I would strategically do this, and she's okay with it this week. I have a sign-up downstairs. Downstairs in the lobby, you'll see there's a sign-up. It says, Counseling with Pastor Jared. 
I have slots available. If you don't find a slot that works for you, you can put your name and number at the bottom, and I will call you this week. And here's what I want to do. I want our church to not just confront tough t- topics, but be willing not just to be rubberneckers looking and surveying the scene, but to be willing to not just announce, hey, this is what's wrong, but to say, how are we going to walk now in which the word God's given us? Are you with me? So after service today, when we leave, there's a sign up downstairs. I challenge you, if the Lord is speaking to you, if God's piercing your heart, if something we talked today, man, really got something stirring or you're struggling in an area, I want to encourage you, don't just leave here and say, man, that was tough. I'll come back next week, see if it's a little bit lighter. I want to encourage you, let's walk in freedom. Let's be a people of freedom. And let's set the standard of what the church of Jesus Christ is all about. Amen.